Um, yeah, so my name is Luke Kavaya. Um, I'm a scientist at IBM. And I sort of wanted to start off by actually thanking all of you, first of all, for the invitation, but also um, for being here. You know, I think it's really tremendous that um, an organization like this exists to, or, you know, brought up by undergrads, for undergrads. Um, it, it's really great to see all the enthusiasm for quantum computing and quantum information science. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to talk today about um, some of the basics and concepts behind the characterization and benchmarking of quantum systems and of quantum computers. Um, I try to keep this uh, at like an overview level. Um, be, please feel free to, to interject at any point in time um, with any questions you have, whether they be you know clarifying if I wasn't clear enough in uh, in my explanation of something, or if you want to know more, um, you know please don't, don't hesitate to uh, to interject. Um, so I thought I would maybe start with just, you know, a little bit about, uh, oh, slides, are you gonna work? There we go. I thought I would just start with a little bit about me um, so that I'm not just, you know, a, a nameless face on a computer screen somewhere off in the world talking to you all. Um, so I'm a Trinidadian Canadian quantum computing theorist. Um, and more or less what I study is how to understand why quantum computers fail uh, and, you know, try to figure out the, ca the causes and the sources of those failures. So I did my undergrad at the University of Waterloo in Canada. I did my PhD in Germany at Saarland University in, in the Saarland in the city known as Saarbrücken. Um, I've been at IBM now um, for almost three years. I'm based out of uh, the San Jose office. And before that, I spent time at Raytheon BBN in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, at the University of Chicago as a postdoc, and also at McGill in Montreal as a postdoc. Uh, so part of this is a nice segue that, you know, if, if you want to travel the world, doing a PhD in physics is not the worst option uh, to get some opportunities to do so. So I, I sort of wanted to pose a kind of very open-ended question um, to start this workshop, which is, you know, what is a quantum computer, right? And I think everybody has their own definition of this, and that varies on, on a sliding scale, right? Um, but to me, the definition that I usually consider when I'm when I when people ask me this is, you know, it, it's it's a device that takes some sort of input data and computes on it using computational rules that are derived from the way we believe the universe operates at a fundamental level, which is in this case quantum mechanics, right? Um, and I think you know that's sort of a definition that if you take too reductionist a viewpoint, could it also incorporate classical computers. Um, but for me, the, dis the distinction is really the rules under which the computations perform, whether they be quantum physics or classical physics. So I think it's important and nice to know, you know, what a quantum computer is. But I thought there was kind of another interesting question that maybe people don't think about a whole lot. But oops, sorry, uh, where is the quantum computer? <laughs> so I, I've chosen this picture in particular for the slide. Now, this is a, a picture of one of our chips. At IBM this is a Heron device that um, has 133 qubits, and we could maybe do a zoom in of it, right? And I'll say, okay, is the chip the quantum computer, right? Is this where all the quantumness and all the quantum computing applications lie? If we like, you know, zoomed into even the chip and how it works, there's several layers to the chip, you might say, okay, let me, uh, sorry, let me just turn my pointer. You might say, is it the qubits, right, which are here? Is that all that, is that, you know, the fundamental op? Uh, it's fundamentally all that matters for the quantum computer. You say, okay, maybe that's the case. Some people take that viewpoint. But then what about this layer here, which is a separate substrate? That's the connecting resonators that allow interaction between the qubits, with, without which, you know, no computation can be performed. So is that the quantum computer as well, or is that part of it? And you can even go, you know, higher up our dilution refrigerators into this nice picture here. I, I really am just showing off all these beautiful pictures, but, um, this is showing a lot of the uh, classical electronics that go into delivering control signals from room temperature down to the, the qubits themselves, right? So is this not also part of the quantum computer? You know, without this, without this filtering, all these filters and all these uh, control wires, you couldn't actually generate any interactions or any operations on the qubits. So isn't that also part of the computer? And then finally, you know, you could go even for, for again further down and look at the, the canisters and casing the qubit chips and say, okay, all of this is here to shield the, the qubits and protect them from the environment to allow them to be isolated and maintain quantum coherence. So isn't this also an equally important part? And it should not this also be considered part of the quantum computer? So really what I'm trying to emphasize with this discussion is that most of a quantum computer is not even quantum in the sense that it's not, its operation is not fundamentally 
requir requires the, the, the coherence or superposition or entanglement. So when it comes to understanding how a quantum computer performs or looking for failures, a lot of it is about benchmarking actually the parts of it that you know necessarily aren't necessarily quantum and we really need to consider the full operation right everything shown in this picture which is the interior of the dilation fridge as well as all the classical control electronics and other and other things that live outside of the fridge and i think another really important message to take home from from this discussion is that there really is no unique skill set for quantum computing there's no one set of things that you need to learn or know or understand to be able to work in the quantum computing industry or, or do quantum computing research in academia, it, there's a huge diversity in background and experience. And people often talk about this in terms of the different hardware modalities, whether you have superconducting qubits or trapped ions, et cetera, but even just across the, the differences of what people do outside of the hardware, um, there's a tremendous amount of, of breadth of scope. And, and you, know, you can think about that in terms of like a sliding scale of, of connecting from more abstract things up on the upper left down to more practical physical things on the bottom right. And often I think when you're presented with quantum computing, especially certainly in, in uh, like lecture style things, people often talk about either the really abstract, the quantum algorithms that we hope will one day enable us to perform uh, faster than classical computations at things like factoring or Shor's algorithm or Grover search or simulate new and more interesting materials and, and, and chemistry with quantum simulation. You know, we get presented a lot of that in undergrad courses and, and grad courses. And on the other hand, you know, we learn a lot about things that build up quantum computing hardware um, in our classes. We thought we learn about circuits and, and uh, superconducting circuits that go into superconducting qubits. Or we might think about trapped ions or neutral atoms, or we think about optical systems and at the, or photonics and even spin qubits. And I think most people have a, or many people have an interpret an impression that this is all that goes into quantum computing. Um, but reality is that a huge amount of effort and reasonable research and reasonable resources go into studying the, the, what connects these things, which is which I've sort of loosely lumped into control hardware, which is all the, the quote unquote classical technology that we use to control our quantum systems, whether they be lasers for neutral atoms or trapped ions or photonics, obviously, or microwave electrons that we use for superconducting qubits. You know, there's a lot of work in FPGAs to enhance and speed up uh, computer control. There's a lot of of interest in how to filter and isolate to keep noise low to, in order to be do you know, high quality control and high quality isolation of, of quantum systems. And of course, everyone knows the pictures and the cryogenics that go into cooling down superconducting qubits, for instance, to to you know to near zero Kelvin to enable uh, coherence. Uh, and there's also a lot of software development that goes into taking these really abstract quantum algorithms or say materials to simulate. And, and turning that into something that's actually useful or usable by the hardware, right? Um, Qiskit is probably the greatest example of that, right? It allows you to write quantum programs that you can you can run on our quantum computers, right? And under you know part as part of Qiskit and as part of other research directions and other uh, things that people do, you have to worry about how you can take an abstract circuit that's some implementation of your algorithm and get it to fit on your hardware, get it to fit optimally on your hardware. Um, you need to think about how can you keep the gate counts as low as possible to reduce error. There are ways to uh, add active error suppression. And another really important thing is just reducing the barrier to entry, right? So that not everybody who is using a quantum computer has to be an expert in quantum computing or in quantum information science. And I hope that you get a sense from just the, <laughs> this, even these like very, very incomplete lists, just how wide a field quantum computing and quantum information science truly is. Right? And there's no way for any one person to be expert, you know, in even some of these blocks, right? It's really a, a it's a team effort and it requires a lot of people and a lot of diverse uh, experience. Um, and of course, the, 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 the final point I want to make is that really when you're looking at characterization and benchmarking, you, you care about, you know, everything in this stack, right? You care about how all of these components work and you care about how all of the interconnects between these components work, how they flow into one another. Uh, which I just, as I had just mentioned, is an impossible task for any one person to take on. So it's really a, a collaborative effort. But I think something else I want to mention, and this is you know my, my own viewpoint, is that really ultimately what we care about is the is how these you know how everything in the middle impacts the top and the bottom, right? So when we're looking at characterization and benchmarking, a lot of the focus is on understanding how the lower things, the things that actually implement the quantum the quantum operations, 
perform at, at algorithms of our choice or how the controls we use and whatnot impact the sort of lower level, native level performance we can achieve in quantum hardware. So you always want, even, even though we're benchmarking and characterizing the whole stack, we always want to reference it to what's ultimately the physical things we're building to enable like a, an improvement cycle to improve upon our hardware or, and or I should say, the applications that we're interested in because that's ultimately what we care about. So I just wanted to, you know, as last sort of introductory slide mentioned that of course, uh, for all of you who are, you know, undergrads now considering what probably what you want to do for the rest of your life, um, with this huge diversity in, in, in topic comes, you know, many career options. And I think quantum computing and quantum information science has shown a huge explosion of opportunities um, within the last five to 10 years. You know, of course the academic route still exists um, and it's still uh, very robust. You can do research, you can do teaching, there's a lot of, of uh, opportunities at U.S. national labs. This is a very U.S.-based pr pr um, presentation. My apologies for that. For those of you who are not in the U.S., um, you know, here's a, just a few, a list of just the ones that are off the top of my head, which have very active uh, quantum computing research divisions. Um, of course, I work in industry, as do many people in the community. Um, we have even a lot of investment from large firms like IBM and Google and Amazon and Intel. And there's a tremendous number of startups. Some of which I've actually put in the left column, um, but uh, you know, there, there's a lot, a lot of going on in this space, and I think there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of excitement around quantum computing. Um, something that I, I weird, really wasn't aware of when I was, you know, in, even in grad school, um, is there's also opportunities, and more and more so, to do consulting for quantum computing, um, either for the government, like Booz Allen and, and MITRE do, or for private industry. So it's really, you know, it really, there really is, uh, I think, a job for everyone's skill set these days. All right, so that sort of um, commences the uh, the overview or the introduction part of my talk. And I'm, I want to give a brief outline now about what the technical material is going to cover. And I really do emphasize, please, at any point, inter interject with questions. Um, so we're going to start with just like a very brief recap of the fundamentals of quantum computing. And I'll follow that with a uh, discussion on how quantum computations fail. Then we'll move on to how do we actually characterize these failures. And finally, since the topic of our challenge for QIs is dynamic circuits, I wanted to briefly introduce the, the ideas behind dynamic circuits as well at the end. So let's you know, start with some, some brief recap. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with you know, the, the, under, the fundamental underlying uh, quantity in a classical computer is the classical bit, right? Uh, and a bit can have one of two states, uh, either zero or one. Uh, my colleague who made these slides uh, uh, has, has represented them as a magnets, right? You know, either with the north pole on top or the south pole on top. Um, and that you might consider the ground or excited state, for instance, of this magnet with the ground having the lower energy uh, configuration. When we go to quantum computing, of course, we expand to quantum bits or qubits, right? Where now you're not either just either in zero or one um, or a classical probability mixture, you're allowed to have any coherent superposition of them. Um, so now the ground and the excited states are vectors in a Hilbert space and any uh, normalized vector in that Hilbert space is a valid quantum state, right? So these, you know, these alpha and beta, which are complex numbers, they're of course their squares are the probabilities of being either in the ground or excited state. Uh, oh, there's a Q and A question. Oh, okay. I'm gonna. Uh, so, um, apologies if I mispronounce your name. But, uh, Jarif asks if a quantum computer can work with photons. Can we build a fully realistic human body or other materials that exist in nature? Um, that is a. Uh, uh, I would say that's a, a very um, far-reaching question. That certainly is outside my um, my uh, domain of expertise. I will say that you know quantum computers have um, tremendous potential for simulation of physical systems, in particular material science, chemistry, um, hopefully eventually biology. Uh, so I think one hopes that I'm certainly optimistic that in the future they will enable us to do better simulation of biological systems, um, like some of the metabolic pathways in the human body. Uh, but but I think the application domain there is not very well understood, and it's something you know, it's something that hopefully uh, people like you on the call will figure out in the coming decades. 
Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the great question. And yeah, please you know, feel free to ask more as we go on. Um, so another way to visualize a quantum state is on the block sphere, uh, where now we would say the, the excited and ground state on the Z poles or the north and south poles of the block sphere. And then any, any vector on the, on the sphere, so that's normalized, is an allowed quantum state. For instance, here's a superposition state shown at the, um, on the equator. And the important things are like qubit need to be a uh, two level quantum system. So they have just two states and they can be prepared in a known initial state. So we can initialize into some state we want and then we can create any superposition state on the block sphere. And if we can do that, then you have a qubit. And if you can do that for many such systems, you have many qubits. So the next sort of fundamental building block of you know, any quantum computation is quantum circuits. Right, which consists of operations that you apply to the qubits to enable your computation. And these operations are unitary gates. Um, so here's a, here's a schematic diagram of a circuit, for instance, uh, that I pulled off of Qiskit. Uh, so we all, you know, the gates that act on qubits, which are the, the squares and the, all, the, all the diagrams on this circuit, um, they can be represented as uh, unitary matrices. For instance, this is the Hadamard gate acting on a qubit. And then it's just matrix vector multiplication to take the out to get the output state from the input state, right? Hopefully, you all are familiar with this from uh, you know third, first or second year quantum mechanics. Another way to think about gates, though, is that they're generated by some Hamiltonian, right? Um, so, so you know, as you may recall, the, the Schrodinger equation, the Hamiltonian is the the derivative generator of the evolution of a state, and then the unitary matrix is like the propagator that moves the state forward in time. So you could think about um, if you try to say do this rotation gate along the sigma x axis, where sigma x is a poly matrix um, with a some angle theta, you could imagine that you implement physically some Hamiltonian that does this uh, sigma x rotation, and you let it evolve for some time t, where you choose t so that the angle is what you want it to be, and that's how you engineer your gate. And this is how we do things in practice in, in physical systems. So, for instance, for our single qubit gates on the IBM. Uh, qubits, we uh, shine microwave uh, pulses at the qubits and that in in engineers this um, sigma x interaction and we time the duration of that pulse such that we get the phase we want and do either the x gate or the Hadamard gate or whatever rotation gate it is we want. So that's it's important to you know keep these two things in mind, right? That like in the mathematical sense, we represent gates as unitaries, but in a practical sense, they're generated by a Hamiltonian. And then to... Um, uh, you know, for two qubit gates, when we attract two qubits together, that's what generates a tangent. So this is an example for the C naught I showed that will create turn a zero zero state into this what's called a Bell state, which is an entangled superposition state. So you need single qubit gates and two qubit gates in order to um, do a full quantum computation. All right. So. Moving on to the second part of the outline uh, or second part of the talk, you know, how do quantum computations fail? I'll pause just very briefly in case there are any questions. All right. All right. So let's return to this picture of the circuit diagram that I had. And I want to say that there are, broadly speaking, two different kinds of errors that can happen in quantum computers. And I don't, I don't mean there are only two potential error sources. I mean that all errors can more or less be binned into one of two categories. Uh, the first is what's called the coherence. And that is really just an, a loss of superposition or entanglement between your qubits. So you can think about it as something that happens to the qubits themselves, um, not necessarily due to the gates, although it could be. Um, but it, it's you know it's important to keep in mind that like decoherence is an attribute of the qubits in some sense. Um, the other kind of error, which is called coherent error, boils down to that you have performed the in, an incorrect Hamiltonian um, on your qubits. And the reason we call this coherent is because the operation, even with the error, is still unitary. So it's still mapping a pure state to a pure state, uh, but it's now no longer doing the correct mapping. So you're no longer on the correct state afterwards. Um, and this is really a feature of the gates, right? It's something somewhere you've gone wrong in the way you control the qubits, the way you implement the Hamiltonians that underlie your gates. So let's talk about decoherence to start, right? So let's we'll go back to this picture of the block sphere that we have. 
And now there, I will say that there are additionally two main kinds of decoherence, right? Um, when you when you study noise and error for a living, like I do, you you appreciate you will you would appreciate that there are many subtleties to what I'm about to say, but at a very coarse grading, there's really only two ways that decoherence can happen. Oh, sorry, I'll just pause for a question. Um, oh, uh, yes, Miguel, I believe there will be a there is a recording being taken. So yeah, so there are two main kinds of decoherence. Um, the first, sorry, one, two, the, I'm monitoring the chat. The first uh, is what's known as energy relaxation. Um, and as its name implies, what that's saying is the qubit loses energy. So you, you may recall that I sort of offhandedly mentioned when we were talking about classical bits that typically the ground and excited states are different energy configurations of some physical system. Um, and the excited state has more energy than the ground state. And that's also true for, for qubits. Uh, so you would, you know, energy relaxation is basically whenever, when in all any state in the system that has more energy than the ground state loses energy and ends up, and ends up in the ground state. So the mechanism of, or the, the feature of this error mechanism is that all states become the ground state after sufficient time. And this is ex an, uh, you know, an exact example of this is something you may have learned about in your undergrad classes, which is spontaneous emission uh, from an atom. The other main kind of decoherence is commonly called dephasing or actually sometimes just called decoherence. Um, and that's really where a superposition becomes classical. So for instance, one example of this would be, you know, this superposition state that I'm showing here, uh, which is a, you know, equal probability superposition of excited and ground, but with a, some relative complex phase e to the i theta. So what dephase, what, what complete dephasing would do would be to turn this into a mixture. So for those of you who aren't familiar with density matrices or Dirac notation in this form, what this is basically saying is that with 50% probability I have excited and 50% probability I have ground, but they're no longer in a coherent superposition, they're in a classical mixture. Um, so the classical probability distribution is no longer has any, there's no way for it to have any quantum interference or anything that's that's manifestly quantum anymore. But I think the, the, the biggest take home message from all of the decoherence discussion is that both of these error mechanisms and all decoherence turn quantum information classical. And that means that they ruin the computer's ability to do quantum computation and to, to therefore achieve any potential speed up over classical computation. Uh, so SC asks, is energy relaxation why zero has an elevated probability of being measured? Uh, and yes, that is one of the dominant sources of why that's the case, um, especially on IBM quantum computers. So if you run a long circuit and you measure all the qubits at the end, you'll see that, you know, compared to the ideal probability distribution, you're probably, you're going to be more likely to have the qubits in the zero state, which is the ground state for our systems. And that is indeed due predominantly to energy relaxation. So that's, that's a great question. David asks, what are some physical causes of decoherence? Now, another great question. I really love these questions. Good job, everyone. Um, so that is uh, very dependent on the specific architecture uh, or, or physical modality underlying the quantum computer. So I can talk a little bit about a few that I'm familiar with. So my, my background and expertise is in superconducting qubits, so that's what I know best. Um, so there, for instance, the, some of the mechanisms behind energy relaxation include uh, interaction with electromagnetic fields around the qubit. Uh, so you may think that you know basically you know any any metallic container is a, is a harmonic oscillator to some frequency to some frequency, right? So when you build these metallic containers that you that go around um, the qubit chips. They will have some electromagnetic modes, and the qubit can emit photons into them. And that's very analogous to what you will see in in uh, trapped ions or neutral atoms, uh, where again the atoms and the ions will emit electrons spontaneously into the into the into free space. Right. So that's a, one of the you know one cause of of um, energy relaxation. There's in superconducting qubits. There are a lot of other sort of engineered harmonic oscillators that we couple to the qubits to do things like readout and control. And similarly, you can also have energy relaxation into those modes. Um, for dephasing in superconducting qubits, a lot of that, the dephasing is uh, is noise and control sources. Uh, so for instance, the you, you um, 
we change the frequency. Some qubits have tunable frequencies where you can change the energy separation between ground and excited state uh, by applying a magnetic flux. And if that magnetic flux has noise, what that means is that the uh, energy separation between the ground and excited state fluctuates as a function of time, and that leads to dephasing. Um, the, the, you know, one way to think about uh, what dephasing is is it's uncertainty in the frequency or the energy separation between the qubit states. Those are you know maybe a few examples of uh, the physical sources of decoherence. Um, another one that plagues uh, superconducting qubits very strongly is actually just various other quantum systems. Uh, so superconducting qubits are built, or you know, metallic uh, circuits that are patterned onto some sort of bulk substrate like sapphire or silicon, um, and and those materials can have uh, defects in them. So you know, places where in the crystal lattice um, electrons have been displaced or ad or or added. And those crystal crystal defects, or they're not actually always even crystallized. Sometimes they're amorphous solids, um, but those defects actually can act like quantum systems themselves and can be highly coherent. And those can interact with our real qubits and cause additional decoherence as well. So the the reality is that there are many, many, many sources of decoherence in all modalities. And you know, I've spoken a lot about the ones in superconducting qubits because that's what I'm familiar with, and that's what my research studies. Uh, trapped ions, neutral atoms, photonics all have similar source or so have, uh, you know sources of their own you know photonics you could think about just loss of photons down a waveguide or in free space right that's a that would be a uh, that would be an energy relaxation um, so it's, it's very hard very specific but the the an important thing to consider is that the impact of the error is the same in the sense that even though the, the physical mechanisms behind the error are different from modality to modality the way that error manifests in the computation is very similar in that it induces either this sort of uh, relaxation-like error mechanism or this dephasing-like error mechanism. And in fact, across all modalities, we more or less use the exact same way to characterize these errors, which is in terms of what we call their T1 and T2 timescales, um, where T1 characterizes how likely your qubit is to lose, or the, the timescale over which your qubit is likely to lose um, an excitation to, to do energy relaxation, and T2 characterizes the timescale over which coherence is lost. And basically, it's an exponential characterization, so it's sort of the probability that you have a relaxation or dephasing error is sort of one minus e to the minus t over t1 or t2, where t is sort of the length of the circuit evolution. So you can see right away that you know longer and deeper circuits will have more chance for relaxation or dephasing. Right. So moving on to coherent error, the other bucket. Right. So as you re may recall from a few slides ago, um, we mentioned and discussed how gates are generated by Hamiltonians. Right. And the Hamiltonians are what we're actually engineering in the in in physics, in the physical systems with our control electronics or our control hardware. So there are a few different ways that this can go wrong. Right. Like, for instance, what if we just engineer the wrong Hamiltonian? Right. So what if you know we try to make sigma x. But we accidentally made a little bit of you know, sigma x plus a little bit of sigma y. And again, these sigmas are the poly matrices, and they more or less correspond to rotations along the x or y axis of the block sphere. And this is, you know, this is actually a very common kind of error, especially in superconducting qubits, where it can happen because the phase of a microwave generator supplying the pulses that engineered this Hamiltonian is just tuned up incorrectly. The another option is like, what if we just, you know, what if we had the pulse on for too long, or if we left the interaction on for too long, right? Then instead of, you know, rotating at an angle of theta, we rotate at some, you know, t plus t prime, where t prime is the additional time that we didn't want. And an example in superconducting qubits for this is sort of when we you know, might poorly calibrate how long our pulses are on for, or we have some leftover pulse that doesn't turn off when we think it does or something. And basically, um, you know, all of these are, uh, actual error sources that we have we contend with in our devices right and we have to develop routines to, to try to minimize um, but again you know I want to emphasize that independent of um, the physical implementation or physical source of the error the the way that they impact quantum circuits is always the same right the coherent error results in some unwanted unitary being added to the circuit and that might be in this in the case of here, where we just had, say, a misaligned rotation. So instead of just the Hadamard gate, we get the Hadamard gate plus some Y rotation, right? Or it might be in this case here, where this one may not might be as obvious, but I changed the pi over two to pi. So in this case, you know, we just 
had the rotation on for too long. So we did the wrong, we did a pi rotation instead of a pi over two rotation along the x axis. But the point being like all of these are coherent errors that implement new unitaries in the circuit that we don't want. All right. So that was my discussion of you know how quantum computers fail. I'll pause again for just a few seconds, take a sip of water while we'll see if there are any any questions before we move on. All right. So now that we know they fail, I think to me it's an important question to ask, okay, how do we figure out how they failed? How do we characterize what the computations have done and then compare to the ideal? So this is an extremely active and large area of research. Uh, so I'm not even going to attempt to give you a flavor of even you know a tiny fraction of it. I'm going to review really the the core fundamental basic concepts here from which everything else builds off of. And the first is the, what's called state tomography. And really the goal of state tomography is just to say, I have an unknown quantum state. Can I figure out what it is? Right? So I don't know, you know, I just know I have some alpha and beta, pure state on a single qubit. Can I learn them? So as a reminder, pure quantum states are vectors, right? But in general, we can have classical uncertainty mixed into our quantum uncertainty. So what general quantum states are what are referred to as density matrices, and that which enables us to say, okay, which also enables us, sorry, to, to incorporate the impact of decoherence on our states. Excuse me. So any density matrix can be expressed by some sort of complete basis of matrices for the space that they live in. So for instance, for a single qubit, you can write any single qubit density matrix as you know, a sum of the poly matrices, right? So what quantum state tomography does is try to learn these coefficients. And the way it does that is just by sort of measuring the expectation value with the corresponding operator in the basis decomposition. Right. Um, so this is really analogous to the way you think about writing a vector in a vector space in a terms of a, a supposition of or a sum of, of basis elements and the overlap between the, the vector and its, the basis element gives you the coefficient. That's exactly what this formula is saying here. And here, we are just trying to figure out what these coefficients are by, say, measuring the state in the sigma x basis to get the sigma x coefficient. Now, of course, to do this, you're gonna need many copies of the unknown state, right? Because you need to perform, you need to calculate the expectation value. So you have to make this measurement many, many times. And unfortunately you need to do, you know, for n qubits, you have to do four to the n different measurements, right? So for instance, you need to measure, for one qubit, you need to measure sigma x or sigma z, sigma y, sigma x, which you can engineer. So if, for instance, we can only measure in along the sigma z basis net natively in a superdecant qubit but you can engineer y and z and x measurements just by adding a rotation gate before to basically rotate the state into the y or x basis and then perform the, the appropriate measurement. But the, the big important point here is that, you know, four to the n is exponential, right? So, so this is actually an exponentially hard problem, right? So it's not quite four to the n. There are a few constraints. For instance, you don't need to measure identity. You know, that just means the trace of the state is one, the state is normalized, but Generally, it's exponentially scaling. So that means it's too hard to do. And in fact, you know, purely unconstrained state tomography has not really been demonstrated beyond mm, less than 10 qubits, um, probably somewhere around five. And there's a lot of work in developing ways to approach straight tomography that uses uh, restricted descriptions of the states to mm -hmm. enable you to actually take less data and but still get a good enough approximation to what the quantum state is. So that sort of you know gives us a, a way to characterize what the state of our system is. But the other thing we need to characterize is what our gates do, and that's what that's the domain of what's called quantum process tomography, where quantum pro process you can think of as a gate or the generalization to whatever operations are allowed on quantum states. So as a reminder, we talked about before for pure quantum states, the only allowed transformations are unitary matrices generated by Hamiltonians. Now is there and now each of these states for n qubits will have two to the n free parameters order two to the n and that means that the unitary is going to have order four to the n free parameters right but for density matrices what's allowed is actually a much larger class of linear operations um, and it's basically anything that maps density matrices to density matrices that 
you know, each density matrix, as we just discussed, has four to the n free parameters. So these linear transformations actually have 16 to the n free parameters. Um, so what quantum process tomography tries to do is to learn these 16 to the n parameters, right, of this quantum process represented by this operator epsilon. And the way to do that is you prepare four to the n basis states, you know, for, and, that, and so this is the example that you do for one qubit. And then you measure in four to the n bases each of these states, right? So overall, you're doing 16 to the n experiments, which is, as you can probably tell, extremely costly. It's much harder than state tomography. I think currently the record for process tomography uh, is, I think, between is either three or four qubit process. Um, so really not a lot. And it is, and again, it's, you know, very active research, cutting edge to try to figure out ways to bring this number of free parameters down to something that can actually be done at much larger scale. Because as a reminder, you know, IBM now has 133 qubit devices available to everyone to use. So, you know, I think I've hopefully motivated that characterization of quantum pro processes and systems, process systems is hard, right? And we have, there's a lot of effort and work and research going into making it possible. But you could take the completely opposite approach and do what we call benchmarking and just say, okay, I don't care about the details of the errors. I don't care about the mechanisms. I don't care about understanding them. I just want to know how bad my systems are. Can I get a measure of how close or how far they are from the ideal, right? So, you know, can we quantify, for instance, how much error might happen per gate in a circuit? Um, and the answer is yes, if you make some assumptions, one of which, and probably the most important here is that roughly any gate you do has the same error. And if that's the case, then you can do what's called a protocol called randomized benchmarking, which roughly goes as such. You say, apply some sequence of gates to your system, L gates, and they're all randomly drawn from some set you have. You do the inverse of that circuit. So ideally, that's the total circuit should just bring you back to your initial state. You measure the qubit state, you repeat this procedure for many different random sequences, all of the same length. And then you repeat that for many different lengths. And then if you plot the probability that you've returned to your initial state, or rather the probability that you have left your initial state, so you probably have gotten an error, right? Um, at, when you average over all of the random circuits right, at every given length, then you should get roughly an exponential decay. And then the sort of the decay constant of that exponential tells you about how much average error there is in the gates in your circuit. And this is the number that you will see reported on a per gate level on the IBM devices, the, the randomized benchmarking error average or average error rate. It gives you a sense of how bad that particular gate is. So I just want to highlight that um, all three of these are available through what's known as Kiskit experiments which is a repository for a variety of different kind of experiments that you might want to run. They're really focused towards what sort of hardware engineers or device theorists like myself, or people studying characterization and, quant and benchmarking would run on a computer. They're not focused towards al algorithms or applications people trying to use a computer. They're more focused towards people trying to understand the hardware. And there's an implementation of state tomography, of process tomography, and of randomized benchmarking, all, all available in Qiskit experiments. And they enable, you know, they allow you to run these without having to really understand too much the details of behind what's going on. All right, um, so in the last few minutes, I just wanted to talk about dynamic circuits since that's the focus of the challenge that we've proposed. And uh, so I think, you know, the way to start that is to ask, what is a dynamic circuit? And I actually wanna answer that via an example. So the example I'm gonna consider is this circuit here, and I'm gonna explain what this circuit is doing. But first of all, I just wanna, you know, what we're gonna try to figure out is what is the outcome of this final measurement shown here, right? So this circuit consists of preparing in the ground state, applying a Hadamard gate, measuring, and then depending on the outcome of that measurement, using classical control to do a conditional Y gate, which means that if the outcome of this measurement is one, the Y gate will be applied. And if it's zero, it will not be applied. And then after that, we do a measurement again, and. We're, at, we're trying to figure out what the outcome of that measurement is. So let's look at the state of the system at these three points in the circuit. In the first point, after the Hadamard gate, we've created an equal probability coherent superposition between the ground and excited state. And then we measure. What a measurement does, a measurement is like perfect to phase. It collapses the superposition into a mixture. And if we don't know what the outcome is, then we have an equal probability mixture 
of zero and one for this initial state because it had an equal probability superposition. So this is sort of the state of the system at two where we are you know, blind, where we're, we're not sure what the outcome is. Now we apply the ligate. And remember, it's conditional ligate. So if it's if this is zero, I'm going to zero apply the ligate. So what's the net effect of that? Well, we're back to zero no matter what, right? So this would always return zero. And this is an example of what's of a, of a qubit reset protocol. So that no matter what initial state we have, if we apply this measurement and conditional ligate, we will always return to the ground state. So what dynamic circuits do over at a, in a high level is they use classical measurement information from earlier in the circuit to, to condition some operation later in the circuit, right? Like for instance, it's conditional ligate, but you can imagine much more complicated conditionals based off many measurement outcomes or doing multi-qubit gates. And I wanna emphasize an important point here, right? There's no free lunch. Measurement collapses the state of the measured qubit and it ends the quantum computation on that qubit, right? Which means you're no longer computing with quantum information, but now with classical. So it's a really you know, hot and approaching topic in the community to understand how to design algorithms and applications that leverage dynamic circuits while understanding that you have to balance that with you know, between the parts of your system that are computing under quantum physics and the parts that are using this classical feed forward dynamic circuit control. That's really you know, a, a, an exciting and active topic of research going on right now. One natural question you might ask is like, you know, what can you actually do with dynamic circuits, right? And a, and a great example um, recently demonstrated by some of my colleagues is that you can generate entanglement between distant qubits. So let's say, for instance, you wanted to, you had you know, this long register of qubits and you wanted to do an entangling gate, a C naught, between the qubit here and the qubit here. But in reality, these are you know on opposite ends, uh, ends of your device, so they're really hard. They're they're not connected. You couldn't do it directly. So you can imagine doing this with what's called a swap network by basically swapping the state of the qubit, all of this qubit, all the way down to the bottom, and, and then doing entangling and then swapping all the way back. Or rather, in this case, you swap halfway in both directions and then half halfway back. And that requires a lot of two cubic means it could induce a lot of error. So it's a very difficult circuit to do. But it turns out that with a dynamic circuit, you can do this with a much smaller number of C naught gates by condition by doing conditional operations on the, the the two qubits you care about based off measurements of these intermediate of the qubits in the middle of the intermediary qubits. And you can look at you know the the sort of gate counts, and you can see that dynamic circuits requires a, roughly a factor of four less C naught than the, the unitary approach. So it's really a much uh, uh, practical, there's big practical savings. Um, another big application of dynamic circuits is in quantum error correction, um, where they're used to uh, actively correct errors as they happen. And you know, quantum error correction is maybe a little bit more of a far reaching goal, but it's something that the field hopes to be at within the next five to 10 years. And it's really looking at a way to stabilize quantum information uh, perpetually, even in the source, even in even in the presence of errors. Uh, so finally, I just want to talk a little bit about um, how dynamic circuits impact what errors we're going to see in our circuits, right? So no quantum correction here, just what what are the kind of errors we might expect for dynamic circuits, right? So dynamic circuits consist of a measurement, right? And classical processing plus feed forward communication and then an operation, right? We call those measurements that happen in the middle of the circuit, mid-circuit measurements, kind of an obvious name. For our systems, superconducting qubits in particular, the measurement and feed forward times are much longer than the gate times, which means any circuit with dynamic, so with any circuit that's dynamic will have a much longer duration than a purely unitary circuit. So I wanna pose a question to you all, what error source increases with longer circuit duration? Feel free to answer in the chat or the QA. That's right, Jacob, it's decoherence, right? So the longer your circuit is, the closer you are to the T1 and T2 time scale of energy relaxation and dephasing, and therefore the higher probability you'll see either you know, energy relaxation or dephasing error. So that's bad, 
right? So you would, should expect longer, decoher you know, worse decoherence error. Um, a few other things, you know, I, I haven't been completely honest with you all. There are other static errors on IBM devices that also compound as you have longer and longer circuits. One example is that uh, for our IBM Eagle devices, so, so many of the qubits, the ones that you can do gates between, uh, will have an always on interaction that's called a ZZ coupling that, that does a phase shift on, on these gates. And so that's an error that you don't want. It's a coherent error, but it's a coherent error that builds up with time because you're sort of, there's no way to turn off this Hamiltonian. It's always it's there. Measurement itself can also induce errors on the unmeasured qubits. Um, do you, it, this is sort of a cross-platform, no matter the modality, superjection qubits, trapped ions, doesn't matter. They all have some source of this. Um, and that's really very hardware specific. So I won't go into any of the details there, but generally they can cause coherent errors or decoherence on qubits that are not being measured. Uh, so characterizing dynamic circuits is, is an even more nascent uh, area of QCVV or quantum characterization, verification, validation. Um, it's a more even nascent area of that research than anything else I've talked about. Uh, I'll, I'll shamelessly, um, plug my work on this, where we were we have extended the randomized benchmarking I talked about earlier to allow you to, to benchmark mid-circuit measurements. But there's other work from other people that are really great coming out to try to understand how to characterize these errors. And hopefully, you know, we'll see some nice implementations from you all in the q Rise challenge. So that's um, everything for me. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions you have and, you know, uh, reach out to me if you have any any further follow-up? Thank you. I'll just pop in here to say, great job, Luke. That was amazing. Um, I, I learned a whole bunch from it and I, I really appreciate everything you walked us through. And also to all the QRISE students that are here, um, if you're participating in the IBM side of this, we'd love to hear a little bit about maybe questions you have or any type of first steps you may have already taken towards solving this challenge. Um, so yeah, really excited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke and Brian. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute or use the chat and Q&A um, to ask. I think maybe everyone asked their questions during the, the chat, which, by the way, you did have some great questions coming in. But, oh, sorry, I spoke just a second too soon. One just came in from David. <laughs> yeah, we've got, so we got another great, great question um, from David this time. Are dynamic circuits an alternate alternative to quantum error correction? That's a really, really good, again, great, great question, question. I'm amazed amazed at the, um, the level of questions that you all are coming up with. Maybe I shouldn't have been amazed. You know, obviously, you're all a talented bunch of people. Um, so... That's a, a, a little bit of a subtle question to answer. So I, I would say that um, dynamic circuits form a very important component in quantum error correction in the sense that um, the, the idea of performing mid-circuit measurements during a computation is fundamental to all quantum error correction. And because what quantum error correction does is enable you to detect the errors that are happening in a circuit by a, pushing the impact of those errors onto other qubits that you can then measure to detect the error. And you do it in a way that preserves the coherence and the quantum information within the data qubits that are doing and storing the computation. So we use dynamic circuits, we use the mid-circuit measurements for that sort of um, uh, error monitoring. And then if you want, there's 
there are pr protocols to quantum, in quantum error correction where, which also use the active part, the feed forward and conditional operations um, to do a few different things. One of which is, is actively correct the errors as they happen. Um, although that's not always required depending on the quantum error correction scheme. For some of them, it's, it's a useful tool to have. Uh, I, I don't necessarily see dynamic circuits as an alternative in the sense that they don't, uh, on their own, unless used in a quantum error correction scheme, they don't achieve all the benefits and all the, um, the positives of quantum error correction. But there's certainly another tool that enables us to extend the reach of what our computers can do or, or what quantum computers can do without um, quantum error correction, uh, because they allow us to say, for instance, generate long range entanglement, um, which would be a very error prone operation otherwise, or they allow us to entangle distant qubit chips um, that might not even be you know, in the same canister on this fridge, for instance, that really long range. So they now allow us to, they do enable uh, an increase in size and an increase of duration, um, but not uh, in, the, in the same way that quantum error correction does, or to the same, I would say, uh, you know, reduction in error. Right. Um, so I, I, I really apologize for, um, I'm really bad with names, so I apologize for mispronouncing yours, um, but Gesia asks, um, is there a place that we can find typical error rates for various gates or T1 or T2, T2 relaxation times for typical operations we do in a circuit? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, so those, are, those numbers are all very platform specific. So they depend not only on the hardware, whether it be superconducting qubits, trapped ions, et cetera, but even on the like specific implementation of that hardware. So they vary between IBM devices, they vary between other comp companies' devices, for us um, on the Qiskit dashboard, and, and Brian, if, if I say something incorrect here, please uh, correct me. Uh, they are, when you look at a device on the, on the IBM Quantum Experience, um, you, they all those numbers are available. So the T1s, the T2s are listed per qubit. The gate errors for the two qubit gates and the single qubit gates are also listed. They might be called RB or um, EP, EPG, which is error per gate, or EPC, error per Clifford, um, but they are all listed and available uh, for all the devices that IPM has um, available, and for that you can you know you can you can get a sense of what the typical or averages are. And I do think even for de the devices, they show like the average across the device as well as another number they report. Uh, so David asks, are, are dynamic circuits unique to um, superconducting circuit architecture? Uh, so the answer to that is no. Um, they could they can be performed in any implementation. Um, my understanding, and I'm not completely up to date with literature across all modalities, is that um, IBM is the only cloud service that offers dynamic circuits right now on our super qubit platform. Um, I know Quantinium has demonstrated them on their trapped ion platform, and there is there are there are ways to access their devices, as far as I know. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with any other modalities having demonstrated dynamic circuits. It's possible they have been demonstrated in neutral atoms as well, but I'm, I'm not uh, confident in that case. All right, we're approaching the end of the hour and it seems the questions are dwindling down. Um, thank you all so much for your great questions. Thanks once again, Luke and Brian for hosting a wonderful workshop.